are bright and shiny in my mind You got me loving, hating, crazy, indecision in my mind Welcome to the Fall Podcast, where the focus is on deer hunting, tips, tricks, tactics, and stories from across the Midwest. And now, here is your host, Aaron Blisey. All right, here we are. It is episode number 88 of the Fall Podcast, and it could be one of my favorite episodes. One one of them that's the most anticipated, and it's going to all be about the great Hambino. And uh, with me today, I've got Justin on the other line, and I've got the red beard himself, Casey Kiefer, next to me in his cot. How are you guys doing? Doing well, man. Well, I'm horizontal in the cot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you got your uh, base layers on. Well, not even base layers, PJs, I guess you could say, hunting PJs. Yeah, I'm hunting PJs, and I'm horizontal here, sitting in Kansas, getting my ass beat, as usual. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> and Justin, you, uh, you, you killed this morning in Wisconsin. Yeah, I did. I, my uh, second tag is cut, and... Uh, I killed in Iowa on the 3rd of November, and then uh, I literally drove to Wisconsin the next day, and I've been there for a week, and uh, there's enough story about that hunt for a whole other podcast, but I missed a I missed a bigger buck than the one I actually ended up killing on the first sit of the first day I went there, and then I hunted seven consecutive days until I had another opportunity, which was this morning, so... It's been a long week. <laughs> it's been last morning. Yeah. Yeah, and you got you got some pretty heavy weather in there too. You guys got a lot of snow. Yeah, it was uh it just started snowing literally as I got down and picked up my arrow looking for blood and uh it was I went back to get the guys and you know, a couple more cameras for the recovery and uh we got back and everything was covered up, but we watched the footage and everybody agreed he was he was not doing too well, so uh, yeah. <laughs> kind of saw where he went in the footage, one of those deals, and just started doing a body search, and uh, I mean, found him in five minutes, so it was, it went well. That's awesome, man. Well, congrats, but I'm, I'm, I am going to have to say that's going to have to take a back burner to, to today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, I, I would agree. Uh. <laughs> Can I can I throw one quick little thing in here? Yeah. This is totally random, and yeah. I, I realize we're going to get to the great Hambino sooner than later. But every time I hear somebody throw something out like, ah, he's not doing too well, or ah, he's hurting, I go back, and I, I think you were there on the turkey hunt with Blanton, with David Blanton. In when, Michigan? Oh, God, no, I don't remember. Where Georgia? The heck it it might have been Georgia. I wasn't there for that one. You weren't in Georgia? No. Oh, well, I shot this turkey down there, and Blanton walks up. <laughs> He looks at the turkey and he goes, well, Casey, I don't think he's going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> and that well, turkey, no shit, David. <laughs> and that turkey was just laying there straight beak meat, and he just goes, I don't think he's going to make it. <laughs> I could just see him saying uh, that, I know, too. in total David fashion, right? I can hear Anyway, that. I, I didn't want to get that. sidetracked. It's just a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I figured today, you know, last week, last Thursday... Uh, Casey and I put the put an end to the my first Iowa trip and in great fashion. And nobody knows the stories but Casey and I, honestly. I mean, we, him and I have been living like hermits together for the last 23 days. We're going on 23, tomorrow's 24. You know, we went to Kansas and then Iowa and then back to Kansas, and we're just getting our butts kicked right now with this weather and the deer movement, and it's just, I mean, we're getting close, but, like, last night, we were close. I mean, you had we had a big deer at 80 yards last night. and oh, yeah. That was bow in hand. Bow in hand, ready to go, and that would have been a good capper to this trip. But, uh, I mean, it's so weird here in Kansas, and, you know, we don't have to get too much into it, but just the deer movement and the, the rut. We don't even really know where the rut's at right now. It's, like, it's, it's so hard to figure out right now. Dude, I was... I was in the same boat, like, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of Wisconsin here, but it's, it was the same way there. It was like a, I couldn't, it's like a trickle rut. Like, you know, you hear that expression or that phrase and it's like, whatever's happening doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And it's like, everything you know about deer is just out the window and like, you just can't put, you can't <laughs> put two and two together. Like I saw, I saw yearlings and two year olds chasing does, like tongues hanging out you know, frozen drool on their face and just all out getting it like you'd expect to see. And then, mm-hmm. you know, you don't see any four-year-olds 
scrapes go dry, everything goes dead, you know, cameras aren't showing nothing, and I'm like, I don't know what happened. Like, I, we missed all the mature deer. I think they, they picked up those first does and had them locked down, or I don't know what the deal was, but. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we're kind of facing the same thing here right now. The problem that we've got is we're still getting trail camera pictures uh, of the usual suspects, but, you know, how do you how do you hunt a deer when... You know, on a southwest wind, he shows up on four different cameras that are a mile apart. Yeah. It's yep. like, you know, try, trying to pattern them at that point. Patterns are out the window now. We're just, yep. we're focusing on, you know, travel corridors and, you know, places and ways to get, ways bucks get from A to B. Yeah, that's exactly and what we're doing. That's what we're trying, that's what we're stuck honing in on. And that can be a, that can be a long game or that can be a, a real quick, short, bang up, while that work kind of game. And, yeah. you know, yesterday we hung that set and it was almost, it was almost uh, like a two hour game after we hung. I mean, we yeah. hung that set with that deer, 11 o'clock. you know, 200 yards away and we hung the set, got in right in on him and he game, came to 80. So it was almost a two hour deal. Instead, we sit here over 24 hours later with our tag still in our pocket. So. <laughs> yeah. That can, uh, the same cannot be said for AB's Iowa tag, however. <laughs> no. Because that is no longer well, it might still be in your pocket, but at least it's punched. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so what I was thinking, Justin, on this one is maybe do a little role reversal. Casey and I would be like kind of the guys that you're asking questions to. Like I said, you don't know anything about this trip other than you know killed a killed a giant. S- sort of, tail. sort of like Step Brothers. We're going to interview you. Yes, <laughs> we're interviewing you. Yeah, perfect. Shout out to Cannon. How much do you make? Before taxes. <laughs> Are you saying pan or pam? I'm sorry, pan or pam. Oh, man. So let's let's get into that. I mean, All right. well, I can kind of kick it off like just by saying, you know, my Iowa tag's punched and I'm super excited with the biggest deer of my life. So yeah, that's, I, I think and I'll, that's, I'll, I'll, and that's, that's the end of the episode, everybody. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for, thanks for listening. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Um, no, I'll 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 go I'll go all the way back to the to the very beginning just quick briefly. Um you just punched a tag that in August you didn't even expect to be getting, if I remember right. You didn't even realize that right. you were put in for this thing and you just got the email and you're like, "Holy shit. What are we going to do?" And yep. here you are. It's exactly what it's too. <laughs> was too. Yeah, and now here you are a week after you just killed your biggest buck your first Iowa deer and I mean, talk about role reversal. Um, I hear Casey was running camera for you. Like you said, you guys have been together for 24 <laughs> days. So, um, you're damn right. I was, <laughs> I just, I, I, and I just want to say that he, he's ran camera for me twice. Last time was in 2016. Oh geez. And we rattled up a buck and killed him too. So we're, 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 we're two for two. So well, I was, I was going to ask <laughs> Casey, like, how does it, hunting. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask Casey, how does it feel to, to be the guy behind the camera? Like I'm, I'm thinking like you must've been like Mr. Miyagi on the sidelines watching, watching your pupil just execute and kick ass. <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty wild. I have had the pleasure of filming AB twice now, and both times we have uh, successfully let the air out of one, or he has anyway. I say we. It's a team effort. It's a team effort. Always. It's all team effort. So no, it was it was cool, man. Being back behind the camera was sweet. It's been uh, it's been a long time, you know. I guess people may forget the days where where Chris and I first started, and that's how we first started was him filming me and me filming him, and yep. we did that for a long time, and then you know as we kind of grew and decided that we really needed to get serious about production. We got a bunch of guys on, on board that know way more about that kind of stuff <laughs> than we do. So, yeah. but you know, I pick up a few tricks here and there along the way. And, uh, I will say I did not double punch. So let's get that <laughs> out of the way. Yeah, it's always good. So, yeah. So now nah, it was cool, man. It was awesome to see. So, so it, it's fun, you know, AB and I hanged hanging trees together for, God, I don't know how many years we going seven on. Years now? Seven years now. Yep. Yeah, we're going on seven years, and he's uh, he's been over my shoulder for a lot of big deer that I've been fortunate enough to take out of the field. So yep. being able to switch that up and actually watch him send an arrow down the pike was pretty sweet. No, that's that's really awesome, guys. It's, I mean, I can only imagine, Aaron, how that felt for you to just like I said, not even knowing you were getting that tag, you're not even expecting it. But what I want to know is. You know, three months ago, you didn't even expect to get this tag, and all of a sudden now you have it. How did you guys formulate a plan to to hunt Iowa in that short of a time frame? Like, I know you were on a farm that you've never been to. 
So like, tell me your process and, and how you decided where to hunt, when to hunt, and just kind of how you broke down the farm once you kind of got there and what kind of e-scouting did you do or, you know, who did, did you know somebody or what was the deal? Well, I don't know if Casey wants to take this first and kind of talk about Chad a little bit um, and what the deal is we have with Chad. You know, Chad's one of your best friends. Yeah. You've known him for a long time. Yeah, we can dive into that a little bit. Yeah, so my Iowa go-to um, uh, is a guy by the name of Chad Johnston. He actually owns uh, Midwest Antler Company down there in Iowa. Okay. Uh, Chad and I go way back a uh, long time, actually, back to the first time that I ever hunted Kansas. And even before that, the first time my brother ever uh, hunted Iowa, sorry, not Kansas, Um I met Chad a long time ago, and actually uh, I went there on an outfitted hunt, and Chad was kind of like my guide when I was down there way back in the day. And, uh, you know, I can remember the nights we used to sit up till 1, 2 o'clock in the morning just shooting the shit, talking about, you know, the land down there and, and, you know, Chad obviously being a local, him knowing all the farmers and all that kind of stuff and, uh, you know, making it a point to say, hey, what if we went out and tried to get access to some of this stuff? What might it look like? And next thing you know, uh, you know, Chad has what is today Midwest Antler Company, which is kind of a smaller kind of private, uh, not necessarily private, but it's a really small boutique kind of outfit. Uh, he runs a small shop there and kills a lot of big deer. Uh, that's what Chad's all about is killing big deer. So uh, we've been hunting with Chad for a really, really long time. So he's always the go-to call uh, of like, hey, man, got my tag. You know, we kind of plan on going down there with him all the time. He's always, as they say, he leaves the lights on for us, which is awesome. So we get to go in there. And uh, this year we, we went in and, yeah, we went on a farm that uh, we've never been to. Chad and I have been looking at that farm well, heck, for, for years. A couple, I mean, yeah. I've known Chad for four years now, and we were kind of looking at it like four years ago. Yeah. So, yeah, we've been looking at it for about four years. Chad, I think, has been looking at it his entire life. <laughs> yeah. uh, and he hasn't been able to get, to get in there. But uh, uh, we know the farmer who farms that ground pretty pretty well. And we, I guess, I don't know, A.B., you and I, obviously your story, you jump in here, but you and I kind of put the screws to them yeah. when we were down there the first go-around of, like, yep. we need to get in there. You know, we, we know the farmer really well, and he's – He's a good old boy. I mean, he's salt to the earth, and he's just a good guy to be around and, and bullshit with and talk to. And, and uh, you know, Chad helps him out a lot around the farm. He's an older guy and doesn't have a lot of help. Well, sometimes Casey and I have went out. I mean, the last time we were down there in October, we went and helped him get a calf out of the, out the, out of the, out of the pond, you know, because he couldn't get down there. So we In a lightning storm. In a lightning <laughs> storm. I mean, raining hard. And, um, you know, so we've got to know the farmer pretty well, and, and when we were down there in October, Casey and I went down there for like a four day, you know, first of October, just to see what we could do. You know, we did kill a doe and, and killed a coyote and saw some decent little bucks, but nothing we really wanted to, you know, put our tag around. And when we were down there, we kind of, like Casey said, put the screws to him and was like, hey, why don't you say, uh, go over and, and, you know, ask the, ask the landowner if, if we can get in there, you know, kind of thing. And he farms, he's, it's all beans, not all beans, but there's a lot of beans on it. And seriously, his beans have only gotten five inches this year. I mean, there's so much deer browse pressure wow. that that was the kind of angle he took to get into the farm. He's like, I need these guys to get in here so they can, you know, kill some deer to, to so I can harvest my crops. He couldn't harvest any of the crops this year. Yeah, the crops are terrible. To put the farm in perspective just quickly, you know, the, that bean bottom, it's basically uh, CRP for uh about a mile and a half to two miles north two miles to the west it's all crp and Mm -hmm. then he's got the only bean crop i mean it's the only thing for two miles north and west so you can imagine in iowa cedar ditches and crp for two miles and then a bean field right in the middle of it (laughs) yeah in the in you know the the farm's an l wasn't it yeah it's 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 an l shape 240 acres and then you know so if you can kind of picture it Paint, a, paint the best pictures I can. On the east side, like on the northeast side of it, is standing corn, and and we don't have the standing corn. It's a it's a neighboring farm, and then it goes down into a, a big CRP bottom, and then in the bottom of that CRP, there's a cedar ditch, and it kind of runs. It's like a T, really, isn't it? It kind of it runs north and south, and then when it gets to the the south point, it goes east and west, and it's a it's a it's a it's a nice cedar bottom. Well, and we can access the farm from the north and the south, which was key. I mean, that was really helpful to be able to do that. And we really knew nothing about this farm. You know, no. you and I have never set foot on this, and Chad really knew nothing about it either. And it was kind of one of those things, 
you know, Chad, we, we don't want to be in Chad's hair. So we were just like, he's got clients and he's got to deal with. So we were like, you know, we'll do our thing. You just kind of, you know, you do your thing kind of thing. And, um, I mean, the first night we went down there, we looked at some aerial stuff. I mean, studied aerials pretty good and figured out, you know, we don't, we, Chad didn't even know what deer were in there. We had no idea what we were getting into. No clue. Zero intel whatsoever. Not, not, not a clue. And to kind of go back a little bit, we were in Kansas for a week before that. And the, the deer movement just shut right off. It was getting warm. And uh, Chad got a hold of us and he's like, man, it's, it's starting to happen up here. You guys should think about possibly coming up here. So, I mean, literally we, we talked about it that night and we were like, load up the truck. Let's get out of there. Three hours drove up there and uh, yeah, got up there and we didn't hunt the next morning cause we got in late. It was like three o'clock in the morning we got in and then uh, shot my bow the next day, kind of got everything ready. And then there was no stands on this farm at all. Like I said, looked at aerials, Found out where we wanted to be. Literally drove the electric ranger right to the tree that we wanted to go in. Hung it in a cedar that was, I'm not kidding you, Casey's got a picture to prove it. <laughs> you know, like the Dasani water bottles? Yeah. This tree, this tree is smaller than a Dasani water bottle. <laughs> like in circumference. <laughs> it was the smallest cedar tree. Wow. <laughs> and her name is Tiny Dancer. Yep. We named her Tiny Dancer. <laughs> because she's tiny and when the wind blows you dance. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I like that. I mean our whole objective to this was to kind of hang an observation stand and just figure out what's going on in the farm, just watch it from a distance, but still one of those, you know, stands that you could kill from. Yeah, you're still in the game. I mean, we're still in the that's game. That's the point. Yeah. yeah. An observation stand that you're still in the game on. And it kind of came down to this one and then the other one down the east fence row, right, yep. that we wanted to get into. But that one, the wind was going to be better for Tiny Dancer, so right. that's why we ultimately went with that one. So to kind of paint where the stand was – we were back up against the standing corn. We were on the inside corner of a sta- the standing corn, and the CRP was all out in front of us. So we figured all the deer movement were going to be all in front of us. Well, we get in, we we hang and bang, got in that night, and, I mean, we had deer all over. Oh, covered. <laughs> I mean, we saw a good 10 bedded on yeah. the in the ditch, the, the south ditch, um, probably 140-inch 10 probably. Yep. Three-year-old. Yep. Um, doe was all over. I mean, deer coming by us, like it's like these deer to, to put it the best, to describe it the best to me, it was like the deer have never been pressured. You know what I mean? Like, they haven't. <laughs> it, it, right. They were just going everywhere and it was like, holy cow, but no, no pushing yet. There was no bucks chasing does, no, nothing like that. Deer were just walking all over and, uh, lo and behold, I mean, you know, about 45 minutes before dark, like a 170 inch deer walks out <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, I'm shitting my pants. <laughs> like, remember how I was get? I was like, Oh, I, remember. I was shaking, <laughs> shaking so bad. Yep. Okay. And let's, let's the put this in the perspective. 740 yards away and they'd be shaking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my biggest deer before this is a 130 inch deer. So, you know, I'm shaking and this deer is walking down the, the CRP. We're, we're looking at the, the, the cedar ditch down in the bottom. So we're up top looking down at it and he's walking this whole cedar ditch and he walked it the whole way. He got to, I think 130 yards was yeah. the closest. Yeah. 130 Did. on the ditch and he's a big deer. I mean, he's 170 inch, 10 double split G2s. I mean, he's, uh, his name is Deuce and he is a, he's a mean dude. Big. Yeah. I'd so we watch him the whole night and walk down this right all by all these cedar trees and down this ditch and, he disappears. Well, we knew that he went to our south. We knew that we had to exit to the north. So, or no, we did, did exit to the south, didn't we? We went to the south that night because he went the he went southwest. So we went. Southeast. That's right. Yep, yep. So we we just inched out of there and got out of there and hopefully didn't didn't you know booger him up. And that was night one. So I'm thinking, holy cat, you know, cats like it's it's we're in Iowa. You know what I mean? I yeah. saw 140 inch deer. Saw. A 170 inch deer, like how could it get any better right. than this? You're like, like my you're, trip's already. You're set, like this is easy. You know? <laughs> this is how it's supposed to be in Iowa. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what it was. So I mean, the next morning we get up and head back to Tiny Dancer, and I mean at first light, 
who shows up at 10 yards? Deuce. <laughs> Out of nowhere. And this big 170-inch deer just, you know, there's good light. Casey goes, he here he is. He came in from Casey's side. And I look back, and I'm like, holy cow. He's at like 10 yards, and there's one limb in my way. And I grab my bow, and I get turned around, and Casey's on him and everything. And I'm trying to find a hole. And Casey could have shot him because he's a little bit higher than me, and he's got just a better angle. Yep. And had to watch him walk off 10 yards uh. just because of the one limb. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, <laughs> two sits now, see this deer twice, almost get an opportunity at him, like, Oh, well, there goes my Iowa hunt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it yep. went from holy shit, this is incredible to, and I'm done. What yep. the hell? I hope that wasn't it. Yeah, you know? yeah. There goes my chance. Yep. Well, and that deer did come in downwind of us too, and he he, I think he knew something was up, but he really didn't care. So that was kind of a testament to, you know, our our scent control and everything and what we were doing. So that helped out, but he walked off and. Honestly, I don't. I don't even remember what we saw the rest of that day, the rest of that morning. We saw some little bucks, and uh, we saw a pile of does. But but deer all over again. Oh, yeah, you know when over. we'd get into the stand, and we had some bulletproof entrance and exits. That was like key. I mean, we hunted Tiny Dancer every set, except for two. That's the only stand we had until yep. we hung one on the bean. Or yep. you hung one on the bean, and then. We ultimately, not to foreshadow too much, but ended up hanging the ditch stand. Yep, yep. The ditch pickle down there. So <laughs> we had, and, and Casey and I talked about it when we were in the stand. Like, you know, a lot of people say, you know, you can't hunt the same stand over and over. Well, you can if you do it the right way. And I feel like we did it the right way. And we, I mean, we saw shooters every sit except for two. Yep. Except for two. And we sat from Saturday all the way until I killed on the next Thursday. And so, I mean, we did it the right way. We entered the right way, exited the right way, got in early, left late. I mean, there was times we got we got pinned in the tree at night, and we were in there for like an hour and a half after dark and finally, you know, could get down. But that next morning, you know, we saw a deuce, saw a whole bunch of little bucks, and then uh, and a whole bunch of does, and, and the deer were just all over, you know. But we knew that the temperature, we were gearing up for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We yep. knew that the temperature was going to drop like significantly, and the deer were just going to be moving. So that's that was our big hope is that what was going to happen. We did have colder temps the whole time. I mean, they were lows in the mornings. They were what were they like thirty degrees, twenty five, thirty degrees in the morning. Yeah, until it fell off a cliff, and when yeah. it fell off a cliff, it fell. Yeah, and then during the day it would get up to forty five, fifty degrees. But yeah, I mean that for the first day, a good first day, and. And that's uh, a, good, a good table setter for sure. That was only your first day. That was the first day. Nuts, first man. day in Iowa. So you just walk into this place brand new. It's new to your buddy. And you guys were just, you just picked a spot based on wind and what the map showed. And, I mean, just just doing what you know how to do. And that's, that's you had those yep. encounters and you, you, you're starting to figure some things out. So. Yeah, well, and I guess this is something I, I haven't even asked Casey, and I can ask him right now, but, like, to get Tiny Dancer, I mean, what were you looking at when you were looking at the map with this spot? Like, what stood out to you? Uh, so the first thing that stood out to me was I wanted to be up high instead of down low. Um, you know, down low, generally speaking, at least in my experience in Iowa anyway, along some of those cedar ditches down low, is where you're going to have the majority of the traffic. But being a brand new farm, I'd rather be up high for the first couple of sits so that we can observe and see what the hell's going on. So that was kind of my first thing is like, all right, let's 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 try to get a vantage point and get up high. It's no different than what we do on drop when we go glassing for moose. It's yep. like, let's get up and let's see. You know, yep. the more the more visibility you have out of the gate, the better, the more you're going to learn, the more intel you're going to get, the more pinpoint precise you can get over time. So that was kind of the first thing was like, all right, let's let's get up high. So from there, it turns into, at least in my head when we were looking at it, was like, all right, if we start here and we start up high, where should we go? Do we want to be up on a fence row? Do we want to be over here on, you know, the east edge? Do we want to be where the water ditches are, where the terraces are? And I think what kind of drew me to that particular spot was the corner, that 90-degree inside corner mm-hmm. right there of that cornfield. Yep. Um, and if you just look at the way the ditches ran, 
We had a north-south ditch at 100 and what was that, 130 yards to that ditch? Yep, yep. A north-south ditch at 130 yards and then an east-west ditch at like 160 yards, 180 yep. yards. So it was like, all right, well, if they're traveling either of those ditches and they want to get up into this corn or vice versa, this corner's got to be the most natural place for them to go. It's mm -hmm. the closest to either one of those ditches. Yep. And lo and behold, we go in there, you know, and I, I guess the third thing would be it's a cedar tree. Cedar tree. And yeah. you know how I feel about cedar I love trees. cedar trees. I mean, I'm a freak for hanging stands anywhere I can in cedar trees, especially small ones like that, just because they're so unsuspecting and I feel like the deer never even look at you. They have mm -hmm. absolutely no idea you're there. Um, but lo and behold, we get up there, we get to the corner, and, you know, bam, there it is. There's the perfect cedar tree right. on that corner. So, like you mentioned earlier, our other option was to the east a little bit further down that line. And what I liked about that spot was it was basically where the, the terrace runs through the, the field, field and cuts the corner, like yep. matches the, I guess, what would be the south edge of the cornfield up at the west edge. There's a terrace that runs that hole like a rainbow. And a lot of times those deer in Iowa, they travel those terraces a lot. When it's lot, standing corn. Especially yeah. when it's standing corn. Mm -hmm. So you look at those terraces and they're just... You know, they're loaded with trails and deer sign and everything else. So it was like that was kind of option one. But then, you know, looking at it as we got over towards that other cedar, it was like, all right, this gives us a much better vantage point. We're still on the inside corner of a cornfield. We can see everything makes sense, and it's a cedar tree. Yep. Let's do this. Well, and my perspective from it, too, is I liked obviously being up high, but I also liked – you know, the entry and exit, like I knew yep. that we could get into it. If we needed a duck in like on the edge of this cornfield, we could get in there and we could get into that stand and leave that stand like without disturbing anything, yep. you know, and this corn to, to put it into perspective as well, this corn is the only food other than the beans that are on this farm. The only food in how far, I mean, it's, it's miles, a it, miles. it's to the North and to the West. It's two miles and two miles. Yeah. There's nothing. Yep. Except this is the for only thing. Our beans and then this corn. <laughs> yep. So that was another thing. I we I I kind of wanted to be right up next to the corn because you never knew, you never know what's going to be coming in and out of it or you know walking the edges of it. So that was kind of, kind of my perspective on that. That just sounds like a lot of. I mean, it just sounds like those deer live there. All that CRP, they just can easy in and out bedding corn cover like all that feed, and you just find those travel routes kind of like you were talked about in Kansas just. It seems like those travel routes are the only place they're gonna be. Just get between that yep. CRP and yeah, and I mean, I can I can visualize that and see exactly why it, it stu stood right out to you. I mean, it sounds perfect. The, the tough thing, the tough thing about this piece, once we actually got boots on the ground, is, and I know this, it might sound insane, but this this thing is so untouched that as we're going through it in the electric UTV it was hard to go through the ditches the deer walk because they're like 12 inch deep cattle trails but there <laughs> oh, is no but there is no cattle on this farm there never it's has never been. been a cattle all, there's never been cattle anywhere trails. on it Jeez. it's all deer trails i wow. forgot all about that like it's, you sit in the stand and how many tra trails did you see through the crp that are just like it's a cattle path you can't even describe it i mean it's it's literally and the question becomes like okay, there's eight massive trails right there, and there's five over here and three there. Which trail are they going to be on? Exactly. You know, because they're, there's nothing that points to one or the other as like, all right, that's the main one. They're all main trails. This place has been so untouched for so long that they are honestly inches deep. I mean, it, it looks like a cattle farm, that, but it's never seen cattle. It's all deer. Yep. Man. That was pretty crazy to me too. I know you guys didn't like – bomb around there too much but did you did you find any sheds or deadheads or anything like that as, when you were kind of looking for places to set up no we honestly i don't we didn't even we we were in and out it was literally like, Here we, go. we didn't go around anywhere we looked at it on the map and we literally drove right to that tree with the ranger that first night hung the stand yeah. and never never drove the ranger again on the farm and we entered and exited on foot to the roads that was literally the only thing we did. We never went anywhere else on the farm. 
Yeah, I couldn't tell you what it looks like on the backside of any no. of those ditches because we no. never went there. Yep. It was like just leave as much of this untouched as humanly possible because you never know. You get into a scenario like that, you know, either it go it can go one way or the other. One way is the deer have literally been left alone for so long that they put up with, you know, they, they kind of, they don't, they're so comfortable they don't pay attention. Right. If that makes sense, which is weird for, to think about a deer because they pretty much live on the edge of their existence at all times but they're so comfortable in there that and they have been for so long that they're just completely relaxed and unpressured or it goes the other way the minute they get scent of something out of the ordinary because they're never pressured in there they're They're gone gone. and when they're gone they're gone for good right you know so we decided to err on the side of we need to take extreme caution here because we don't want to run into the ladder where if these deer catch scent of us or they catch a sight of us they're gone and out of here for good. So, I mean, we were quick in, quick out every single time, cover of darkness, like the, yep. whole, the whole nine yards. Yep. That was, that was, you know, key for us. We wanted to make sure we talked about it. We wanted to make sure we were, you know, we didn't want these deer to even know that we even existed on this farm. So. That's crazy, man. That just sounds like a, like something out of, uh, I mean, I don't want to say I'm too cliche here, but like I'd have a dream. You just walk in and like everything's just so perfect and, it's almost like you couldn't do anything wrong. Well, the, the for the first day we couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> so know, what? well, other than a limb being, you know, and that was one of the things too. We didn't want to cut too many limbs. That's something Casey and I we don't do a lot of and when we're hanging a new stand, especially like a hang and bang when it's in season, we don't like to cut a lot of limbs. I mean, the the less scent that we disperse the better, you know. And, and this one kind of nabbed us, but I mean, what do you do? I mean, in hindsight, it it worked out, but and it all depends on the tree too. Yeah. I think we talk about this a lot of times, you know, if I if I'm trimming out a tree where I'm expecting deer to just pass by and not be out in front of me for a while, I'll trim a little bit more than normal because I don't feel like I have to survive them. You know what I yep, mean? It's yeah. like they're they're in transit, they're left to right or they're passing by, they're not in their feeding or they're not in there, you know, where they can see me after they've been standing there for seven minutes. It's like, but you know, again, we aired on the side of caution and it was like, all right, that's enough for now. Let's get into this and see what we see. Right, just and then and adjust one, from there. And then damage. one limb cost you a hundred and seventy inch white tail, <laughs> but it, it paid <laughs> off, and we'll get to that. Hey, don't, 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 don't spoil the story. Yeah, I, no, I'm so excited. So I think we covered day one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yep. or, and I think we, well, yeah, day one. Yep, thirty minutes. So I mean, that one. was the game plan. We, <laughs> yeah. 170 inch deer, 140 inch deer, and we doze all over. So I mean, day two, we we had the same same game plan we were going to go in the tiny dancer and and try it again and maybe deuce would come by i mean deuce was on my mind it was like but also you kept telling me he's like we don't know what's in here we didn't put any cameras out that was Nothing. part of the, we weren't going to put any cameras out we were just going to like ride the way ride the hole see what happened you know um and was it that second morning that the nine came in yep <laughs> hold on to your hats here. yep <laughs> <laughs> hold on to your hats so we get into the stand and it's it's cracking day and I I pick the binos up we're both like glass in the CRP and you can just see deer just walking all over the CRP field the CRP field and I I we look down in the the cedar ditch below us and is that where we first saw him? Yeah, when he was co- he was coming up that ditch. Yep, and there was two little bucks down in the bottom chasing those does. Yep. Also, so there we. We finally saw some chasing, and that's when we saw Ted for the first time, mm-hmm. too, on the side hill. Um, so there's these does down the bottom, and, and these little bucks are nudging around, and all of a sudden here here's this this big nine, good nine. I mean, what did you think he was, probably 150-inch nine? Yeah, I'd probably touch him on 50, yeah. And uh, rattled him in the first time? Well, I didn't rattle him in. I grunted him in. Grunted the first time. He, yeah, because remember, he went up the ditch, yep. and then he went to where that pond dam yep. is. Yep. And he scooted around the backside of the cedar. And that's when I said, give me that grunter. And you gave me that grunt, and I just I hit him yep. with a chasing grunt. And he freaking popped back around that seat and right. looked our yep. direction and woof, right to us. He came right to us. And he came on the weak side of the tree and had me tied in knots. And if you can believe me, like this is 150-inch nine, he's coming and he's looking for, you know, he's looking for a confrontation. And in hindsight, I should have 
let him come and come by us. You know, if I was a lefty, I could have been sitting down and pulled back. Um, I had to stand up, turn around. You know, Casey's on him, filming him, and he gets to 40 yards and he's coming. It's a hard angle, coming right at us. And I go to draw, and he kind of catches me in the tree. And I'm like, crap. And I'm like at quarter draw, and then he, like, we beat him. And then he, he puts his head down, he flicks his tail. And I'm like, okay. So then I go draw again, and he gets me again. And I'm like, damn it. You know, and I'm, I'm panicking, freaking out here, <laughs> blackout. And, <laughs> and he comes about five yards closer, and I go to draw again, and, and he kind of catches movement again. And then he didn't like that one, and he goes to turn, and Casey stops him with a grunt, and he's at 35 yards, and I have another limb in my way, and he's completely broadside stopped, good footage, and I'm like, you know, because Casey didn't know I had a limb. He just stopped him, which he did did find it perfect. And if I could have didn't have that limb, you know, and there's a 150 inch deer <laughs> that we could have slipped an arrow through. That's only morning number two. <laughs> and that was my thought. Like, and that was a limb that we couldn't have trimmed. Let's nope, let's no, get that out there. This was one. a limited distance that we never thought would even come in close to being into play. And yeah, day two it came into play, morning number two. And that's why when he turned, like the gig was up. The third time he caught that little movement. Yep. It was like you could tell. I mean, he started long necking, and he when he swung, it was like all right, it's now or never. So I just brat. And he stopped, and I was sitting there, and I'm like, oh, my God, I hit record. He's in focus. Please shoot. Please shoot. shoot, Please shoot. shoot. Please shoot. And then nothing happened, and he walked away, and I was like, well, don't I suck. Yeah. No, it it was good. I mean, it was just that limb and me getting – pin three times so yeah. obviously i'm a i'm a i'm a head case after that <laughs> i'm just like are you kidding me like what what do i have to do there goes my one chance because i'm gonna tell you growing up in michigan you have a mindset that you might only get one opportunity a year you know what i mean yeah. and i had a opportunity at 170 inch deer the day before and now this one so i'm like here we go i believe i believe the words were I could puke right now. Yeah. I think that's what you said. Is <laughs> or I, time. I, I could puke right now. Or tie my tether around my neck and just jump. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I know that feeling. Uh, but it was it was just picture perfect. And, you know, after he, he left, we were talking in the tree and everything. And, and I could have let him. He probably would have swung out right in front of us. But the cedar we were in, I w- it was like kind of cut. A hole was cut in it. And I had... He had to be like 20, 25 yards out in front of me to me even be able to get him. And all the deer that were coming that went by us were really tight to us, and I couldn't even see him. So I was kind of worried about that too. But. Well, those cedars are like an upside-down umbrella, how they yep. come up it's underneath exactly you like yeah. that. So, I mean, if a deer's at 10 yards, you actually don't have a shot. You need them at 15, 20, 25. Like yep. you need them out at a distance a little bit. So that was debacle number one. <laughs> debacle number two <laughs> number two number limb two. number two as well yeah. so yeah i mean my mindset after that was like shit but also it was like i'm in iowa in the rut so you never know what might happen and then you know the the movement kind of it kind of fell off around that, that night it was just poof yep oh so you're thinking that, you was blew that the, the whole night, place out yeah well, not the whole place, but like kind of blue. I mean, how many shooters do you think could be on one piece? Right. Realistically, you know, got a 170 inch deer, 140, 150 now, and it's like, man, you get really got three of them here, and it's like, oh, and we did see Ted. So mm-hmm. after that happened, or it might have been before. It was before he went. Before up, he went up the hill. Yep. Yeah, before before the nine came in, on the other side of the CR or the the cedar ditch. There was a buck chasing a doe, big old, uh, framey eight pointer, and I mean just a big bodied, burly deer. Yeah, he he probably score 140 inches, but man, I mean just a talk hammer. About, talk about a badass 140 yeah. inches. That deer's a seven year old. Yeah. I mean he's just an old old deer. He just looks like a Hereford steer, yeah. you know, with antlers, and he's just so we named him Ted. No, he chased a, a doe over the hill, and, and we we're like, man, that's that's a hammer. I'd shoot that deer, too, you know. I'd be super happy with that deer. Old, mature eight-pointer, 140-inch eight, just a just a massive, like, just solid eight-pointer, you know. Yep. So that was morning number two. And then uh, night number two, I mean, so basically our game plan throughout this whole thing was we were hunting as long as we could in the morning, and then once the movement kind of, you know, died down, we'd get out for, I mean, 
an hour, hour and a half, two hours at the most, and we'd be getting right back in. So we were putting in like basically all day sits. I mean, we didn't sit out, you know, much more than than that, you know, two hours at the most, and then we were getting right back in. We were just leaving everything right in the tree and getting back in. Um, and that second night, I, I'm kind of a blur. I can't remember what happened the second it was, night. The second night was slow. It was real slow. I think it was the first night we didn't see – a shooter, yep, I it, think. Yeah, we saw. I mean, we saw deer, but they were all at a distance, and it was pretty slow. Yep. And then the uh, third morning, got back into Tiny Dancer, and just to kind of recap a little bit, all these bucks, like Deuce, Ted, and then the nine, they were all going by this little patch of cedars in the bottom, and we and we started talking about man, if we were in that cedar down there we'd have an opportunity at every one of those bucks, you know, and even the little bucks, like all those deer that was in the bottom of the ditch in the very bottom. And it was like, if we were in that tree, we could have killed every one of those bucks. And you know, the, the, the gears start turning, you know, do we move a little bit? Do we get down there? Or do we just ride it out? Because we could have had two opportunities at deer already. We, we should have killed already. Yeah. I mean, you we know? should technically, we should have been done. Yeah. So it was just like the gears were turning, and what and and what do you kind of do right from there? And but that's where observation pays off too. Mm-hmm. You know, that's where being up high allows you to look over all that stuff and see what's going on. But that's the battle that we fought mentally was like, boy, that's a really good spot down there. I mean, if you can imagine the ditch being in the shape of a Y, right where the the top of the Y splits, the tree that they were all walking by was right there at that split point. Okay. So you know, if they were coming from if they were coming from the northwest or the northeast, it didn't matter because they rode both those ditches down to that common place, that, that confluence right there, to form the stem of the Y. They'd follow those right down. So, you know, but the battle was, man, that's a great spot. A lot of deer are going by there, but we've also had two opportunities out of this tree. So do we just be patient and continue yep. to sit it out? And then the other factor to that whole thing is there is so many deer in here that it's virtually impossible for us to get down there to hang the stand because yep. we don't want to blow anything up. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and that's that was another thing too. I mean, in the winds, we had better wind from Tiny Dancer than yeah. down there. I mean, one wrong wind and we could have blew the whole area. Oh, that's, yeah. you know, so we were just being a little more passive than aggressive. You know, we didn't need to be aggressive yet. Yep. Um, cuz like Casey said, I mean, we had confidence in Tiny Dancer. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> The first couple of days, and we've had two opportunities at great deer, two of, you know, the deer that be my biggest deer ever. And so I'm also down in the dumps, but I'm very excited, you know, and it wasn't like a wind all out of the sails because we had, you know, good movement, good shooters and everything. But what happened the next day, we got back in the stand and right at first light, I look over at 20 yards and it was just cracking day. And who stands at 20 yards is the nine point again, <laughs> the 150 inch nine at 20 yards. I have no idea where he came from and he's just standing right there. And I, I got Casey and he got on him. I got my bow and he's at 20 and I said, are you good? And he goes, I'm at 64,000 ISO. And I said, crap, <laughs> <laughs> no, don't tell me that. Cause I, I could have shot him right there and he's at 20 yards and could have, could have put one through him and, you know, just not enough camera light. And that's just, I mean, you know, Justin, too, that's yeah. just the thing that you thats just you deal with. Y- you got to roll with that one. You got to say no. Yep. Well, and then when he said 64,000, he, no. he didn't say no. I said no. 64,000. I was letting you I was letting you make the call on that. He said 64,000? <laughs> <Like, laughs> yeah, exactly. Your call? Mm. And I'm like, as bad as it was, I mean, he was quartering away at one point. As bad as it was for let me, you know, for me to let him walk, it was like, I can't. I think the producer and took over me in there was like, that is not going to be good. That's not what we came here for. Let's do it the right way. And yeah. yep. decided to let him walk out. And I watched him walk across the CRP all the way down to that cedar tree that, and walked right by that cedar tree that we wanted to get in. And uh, yeah, and it got, it got daylight. And all of a sudden we see a deer going up the other side. Hell, Casey's like, there, that's a big deer. Not knowing who it was, I don't think you knew who it was at first. Oh, did you? I, I could just see his rack. I yeah. didn't even put him in the binos. Yep. I was like, "Yep." And I, I reached over for the antlers and cracked him once, and kind of did a little movement with him. And he stopped on a dime and looked, and it was like a matter of ten seconds, and he was on a beeline right for us, coming on the same trail that he same came in. <laughs> exact thing he did the day before. Yeah. 
This time, he gets to like 60 yards, and I almost feel like he was like, I've done this before. Yeah. <laughs> this Yesterday was a grunt. <laughs> Today was a rattle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know if I should be doing this again. We realized it was the nine again, and he dove into the corn, and we're like, okay, he's going to come up the corn edge, possibly, and waited for him, and nothing. I think gone. he got – we had that, that fawn that was back there all the yep. time. I think he got a little sidetracked with that fawn and that corn, to be honest. That's the only explanation because the way he cut in, he should have sucked right around that inside corner, but, yep. but he didn't, so – yeah, and that was the nine pointer. So I mean, again, good movement all morning. Good does. Saw box in the distance. Um, we decided to get down at like ten o'clock and ten or eleven somewhere somewhere in there. Went back, got a bite to eat. It was like let's get back in the stand. I think we went in at like a little after noon, noon noon thirty. As we're walking to Tiny Dancer, uh, down in the cedar ditch. We see a spike. There was a spike down there. Yep. Just standing there watching us. And I, I, one of those like, hmm, yeah, that's not normal. Like he should be running away right now. But he's not. And to to me, I thought to myself, I didn't tell Casey or nothing. I'm like, I just first I thought, I'm like, there's got to be a doe in there. Why yep. would he be with a doe? Yeah. Like, so we kept walking. And he's just watching us walk. And I'm like, man. And I kind of catch something out of the corner of my eye. And I see this big old tree limb. Just go down to the ground and come back up, and I'm like, Case. And I looked, picked the binos up, and there's Ted. And how far is he away? Oh, from where we were standing? Yes. 100, and 100 yards. And we're like a turd in a punch bowl. We're in the middle of this CRP <laughs> field that's only knee high. He could see us, plain as day. Oh, yeah. You know? So we, we kind of ducked down, trying to formulate a game plan. We got to get to the stand all, everything's in the stand the cameras the bow everything we got nothing if, if it wasn't we had the wind we we, we could have tried to we pull it made off a move, yeah. yeah but we left it all in the tree so the cornfield was up to our our left probably 60 yards probably so we decided to like basically belly crawl to the corn get on the edge of the corn and it was a wooded fence row get in the fence row and try to make it to our stand. I mean, it took us 45 minutes. I mean, yeah. we had to we had to inch our way to it. Finally, we got to the base of the tree, and he could still see us if he was to look up. We didn't know there was a doe there yet, but we figured there was. And because he wasn't moving, he was standing right there, right underneath the tree that we wanted to be in. Um, and finally, eventually, we get in the tree, our tree, and we watch him the whole day. I mean, for five hours. We finally see the doe that he's with. And a little buck came up and ran her out of there. He chased him down in the down farther in the ditch. And then, you know, an hour before dark, he runs out with her. And they came eventually came to, like, 80 yards and yep. wouldn't come any closer. And we were pinned in the stand that night. I mean, we had deer all over us. He was out in the field. So we stayed a well after dark. Before we got out. Oh, yeah, we were, hell, we were probably 45 minutes after dark at still least. sitting in that tree. At least. You know, and before we got out. And then, we, of course, we exited to the south because yep. they went to the north. So we're like, all right, let's get out that way. Yep. So we, we got out of there, left everything in the tree, took the cameras, left the bow and arm, tree base, all that stuff in there. Um, got in the next morning. and So this is day five now? Day four. Four. Day four. Four or five. One of those two. Yeah. You're going, you're going into day five. It was five. slow. Yeah, okay. it was slow to the point where I f- we both kind of talked about how possibly let's get on the beans. Right. Because, no, I saw a big deer run down into you the bedding area. You saw that deer run off the top. That's exactly what it was. Oh, Way off in the distance, I picked the binos up and had this big deer run down into this bedding area over by the beans on, like, the – it'd be the southwest side of the farm. So I'm like, oh, maybe we'll go over there and, and try our luck over there. So Casey had some emails and, and some work stuff he had to do. So Chad and I went in there midday. Like, I mean, we hung it in like 20 minutes. Got a set of Millennium's hung and went back, got Casey, grabbed her stuff, got in the stand. And we we saw some good movement. Saw like 12 does that night, a good young buck um, chasing, snort wheezing, pretty cool. We had and, that buck come, sounded like a pig. I thought it was a pig coming up the fence line. Yeah. Remember that? He was yep. just. It's exactly how. What the hell was going on? Constant. That he was doing it constantly, too. Yeah. Yeah, yep. he walked right under, literally right under our tree. Yep. So, yeah, it was it was good. I mean, it wasn't crazy, but it was it was a decent night, yeah. Yep. And then, so the next day, we're like, going to go back to Tiny Dancer. 
you know, because we had a good win for that. Because I don't think we had a good win for we that didn't. night for Tiny Dancer. No, we had a terrible win. We had a northeast win. Yep. And we and I saw that big deer going down in the bedding, so we we're like, let's go over there. So the next day we get back into the dancer, and lo and behold, is the first time we laid eyes on the great Hambino, and <laughs> this was crazy. We were sitting there, good movement all morning. Um, this would be Wednesday morning, Tuesday and Wednesday, it doesn't matter. A good movement, and we had a shooter out in front of us. I can't remember who it was. The nine was back. The nine. You're right. The nine was back. So we were starting to see the nine. Deuce is gone. Don't know where he's at. Ted hasn't shown back up, and the nine was out in front of us, and Casey said, let me see those antlers. He was going to crack them. He was facing the corn. He's like, let's try to draw something out of this corn. And he cracks them together and just going at it. And all of a sudden I look over and I just see a wall of tines running <laughs> down. And I literally shit. I, I, was, I said, all I said was big deer. I said, giant deer, really big deer. I just kept saying big deer, big deer. And he's running on the other side of some cedar trees, and I could just see him as he goes through the cedars. And he comes down to this opening in the cedars, and he stops, and he looks, and I'm like, holy crap. Like, this is a giant deer. And uh, he had a doe in front of him and pulled the binos up, and I have no idea what he had going on. Just knew he was big. I mean, big body, you know, muscular, and just giant antlers. And... I think the doe ended up outrunning him or something. He the doe lost him. The doe ran down to the to the tree in to the, the tree ditch. where we wanted to be. Yeah, she this ran right down into that same spot. Infamous tree that we wanted to be, and he was so focused on I think the rattling because then started grunting at him too, tried to get him over, and he was looking at us and and he just wasn't having it and walked right underneath that tree, you know, the, the tree we wanted to be in, and all of a sudden he ended up walking right in front of us, 130 yards. And walked out of our lives. He had that moment of like, I should I could, go investigate. I could go over there and fight someone, or I could continue to look for her. Right. And he thought about it long and hard. He did. And then he was just like, "Yeah, I'm gonna go look for her. I'm not in the mood." Yeah, <laughs> you know exactly. And, and it was. I mean, it was that moment of like, I was staring at him in the camera, and I'm like, "Just do it." Just do it. You know you want to get yep. up here. Just do it. I Just mean, come. I was trying to will him into it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I couldn't. And yeah, he, yeah I know how that feels. Carried on his merry way. <laughs> so, and but then, it, it's that it's that glimmer of hope. It's that like, oh man, this might happen. And then it's that ah, oh, that didn't. Happen. All the wind goes out of your sails. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yep. that didn't happen. Yep. Oh man. You know, and the and the pressure's starting to build a little bit on my end too because I know we got to get back to Kansas. We got because I. I don't want to miss the rut in Kansas, and I don't want to, like, you know, hit or miss a little bit of the rut in Iowa. So it doesn't want to, you don't want to, like, miss it and then miss it. So it's, like, starting to feel a little bit of pressure. We've been here for five days. So it's, like, we got to make something happen. Should have killed on the first day. Should have killed on the second day. Possibly the third day. So it's, like, you know, you're starting to feel a little bit. Of, I put pressure on myself. And then, you know, this happens, and it's, like, but once we saw that deer, it's like, okay, game's on. Like, we're going to figure you out. We're going to try to kill you. <laughs> and once that happened, I mean, he we, we waited him out. Oh, yeah. You know, he went down in that ditch, and we didn't know where he was at. We were like, we're waiting him out. Yep. We gave him a couple hours. Yeah. To show back up. Yep. And he never did. And we decided, that's when we decided to move, get get down move the stand down to that tree. Yeah. It was like a right here, right now, let's go. We got to do it. So The we, beauty of millennium. The, <laughs> the, the beauty of a millennium stand. We took everything down, and we walked right down there and hung it right then. We got into a tree. I don't know how we got into it. This one was a little bigger. It was, it was a little bigger. Yeah, it was a little bigger. It was like, <laughs> Not much bigger. Yeah, it was, it was a little bit bigger. Maybe a beer can size. Maybe a beer can. Yeah. <laughs> and got in it. And went back to the house real quick for maybe an hour at the most. Yep. Got back in, had a really slow night. Never saw a shooter, saw like six does. Yeah, it was slow. Yep. And this was Wednesday night, so 
Thursday, we were going to get a 30 degree drop in temp. Yep. So we knew the pressure was, you know, pressure system would come. It was going to get cold. It was going to be like 20, 18, 20 degrees. Yep. 16. But, 16, sorry. 16 in the morning. And we knew it was going to be like this was going to be the day. So we get in that next morning and slow to start off. You know, usually we were getting in the stand. It was still dark. You could glass deer in the CRP. Not this morning. This was slow. And, you know, like I said about, you know, putting pressure on myself. Like it was just one of those like, man, the deer should be moving. You know, it's cold. And we had two does show up underneath of us, in the ditch underneath of us watching them, and the sun's coming up, and we can see Tiny Dancer. So this new stand, we're calling it the Hot Corner. It's called the Hot Corner because it's right there. The deer show up. You can't really see deer if they're coming from the north at all. They just show up, and they're tight right to you. Okay. And uh, we're watching the Hot Corner. Uh, we're watching Tiny Dancer, and the sun's coming up, and all of a sudden, out of my peripherals, I see deer walking literally right under Tiny Dancer. There's like four does walking underneath of it. And we've got these two does underneath of us, and I'm like, I don't want to move. But I'm like, I got a glass up there because there might be something else up there. So I picked the binos up. Who's standing 10 yards underneath the tiny dancer? The great Hambino. <laughs> <laughs> underneath the formerly known as tiny dancer because there's no tree stand there anymore. There's no stand there. <laughs> And I'm not kidding you, Justin. He is standing broadside, quartering away, ten yards from the tree. Yep. And it's the most beautiful footage. Literally, the footage that we got of him that morning was epic, because it was like the perfect sun coming up, frost. He he had frost all over his back. You could see his oh, breath man. every time he'd come out. He was nudging these does. He was snort wheezing. He was lip curling. It was just unbelievable. And I was in focus. And he was in focus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yep. the positive to that. I was in focus. So, But the good thing about it was is we had two does underneath of us. So I'm thinking these other does might think, oh, we're going to go down here. All these deer congregate always. Every deer comes right to this tree that we're in now. So I'm thinking we're in the chips here. And they're angling our way. We were in the chips up there. <laughs> <laughs> and now hopefully we're in the chips yeah. down here. I mean, yeah. talk about... The wind going out of your sails when you finally make the decision to move a tree stand and you do it. And the next morning, the first sit, you look up and that giant is standing under where you were sitting. I mean, that is like an ultimate just like, oh, that's so bad. So bad. Well, and you hear everybody talk about it, too. You zig, they zag kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Like, But that's like the first time it actually really happened to me when I had a bow in my hand and a deer of this caliber. Yeah. And I'm like... I seriously wanted to puke. Like, I was oh, yeah. swearing in the tree. I, I'm like, <laughs> are you were kidding me? <laughs> you were are not you happy. Are you kidding me? I, I was not happy. Yeah. I, I wanted to throw everything out of the tree. He, but came, it, he came to 80. He came to 80 yards. Yep. And he ran the doe down into the, uh, the ditch that he initially ran from the day before. And there's a pond over there, and it's got cedars around it, and it's pretty grown up, you know. And like I said, the the footage is epic. It's awesome footage. He runs her down in there, and the whole field clears. Not a deer. I mean, the does are gone. The does are running, chasing, everything. Nothing. And once that happened, I looked at Casey, and I said, I don't know how I'm feeling right now. <laughs> like, I, li I just could not explain it. It was, I was so upset at myself. And so upset that, like, that happened right there. Like, that's the fourth time at a deer from that tree we should have just stayed there. You know, so then the gears start turning again. Should you move the stand again? Should you sit it out here? Will he come back? Will any of these other shooters come back? You know, and you haven't, we haven't seen a, a shooter in a couple of days other than the nine. Um, but you remember what I said, though. We were, we were talking about Tiny Dancer and being able to sit there and stare at that tree just a hundred and whatever, 120 yards away or 130 yards away. You know, <clears throat> if there hadn't been a tree stand in that tree, it would have been no big deal. It would have been like, oh, whatever, he went by there today instead of down here. But the fact that there was a stand up there <laughs> makes it that much worse. Right. And then the other thing that we talked about is after he after he disappeared that morning, the other thing we talked about is, you know, 
up to up until the point where we saw him up there, we had all the confidence in the world. In Tiny Dancer. In, in Hot Corner. Or Hot Corner, yes. Yes, we had all the confidence in the world, or else we never would have moved that tree stand. Mm-hmm. It was like we finally made that decision of we're in the game up here, we're really in the game down yes. there. Yep. So let's move it. So, you know, but then you see that deer go by up there and all of a sudden the wind goes out of your sails. But it was there was no reason for the wind to go out because we moved that stand for right. a reason. We had all the confidence in that new tree. Well, and, and I even said to you, I said, I got to make it sound like that deer didn't know we were not there that day. Yes. You know what I mean? It wasn't like he was like, oh, AB's not in the stand that morning. I'm going to go by the stand. Exactly. Today. You know, it's yep. not like you give them too much credit kind yeah. of thing. They're deer, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, they're deer. And, you know, when that happened, you, you want to be upset, but then it's like you just kind of, like Casey said, we're really in the game down here. And I don't want this to sound like, I don't know. I don't want it to sound bad or anything, but like me personally, I knew I was going to, I knew 100% I was going to get an opportunity at a deer mm-hmm. there. I knew out of, that new, out of the hot, corner. out of the new hot corner. Yep. I knew it, it was, it was m- more percentage of a guarantee than you could even imagine. I just knew it was going to happen. Don't know which deer didn't know right. what deer, but, but I knew it was going to happen. Whatever, what I did with that opportunity is to be seen but i knew i've never had a guarantee in my life in my head so just from all the movement all the shooters we saw from this this tree so that was in the back of my head too but it was like man he was right there right <laughs> there you know like a deer of a lifetime and uh so we contemplated a little bit after he had left you know we waited him out for a while and I think we were running out of batteries. I think it was getting yep. cold, and we needed to charge some batteries. Yep. I was down to one A7 battery, and it had like 23 minutes. Yep, there and we so we needed to go back and charge some batteries. So we got down from the tree, and we were like, we're only going to be gone for an hour at the most, hour and a half. And But we knew we had to leave. He He ran to the north, and we had to leave to the north. But we did a big loop. I mean, way out of our way. Oh, yeah, up over the ridge so we couldn't, well, first we went south yep. to go up over the ridge to the west, and then we got behind the top of the ridge yep. and rode that all the way up to the road so that he couldn't see us up yep. there. Because we didn't know if he was in the ditch around the pond right. or if he went across the road because well, yeah, there's a road there too. Yep. So, I mean, it took us a while to to get out of there. I mean, it wasn't like A to B. It was like we went from A to to. Z to to J to A, you know, whatever. We we got out of there. Uh, it took us a while, though. So we got out of there, went and charged some batteries, and got right back in the stand. But when we got back in the stand, we did the same thing. We did, like, a big old loop and got back in. And we were back in sitting at, mm, we left at 11, and I think we were back in at 1230. Yep, we sat down at, like, yeah, 1220 or something. Yep. And, um... Yeah, we sat down and you know, it was it was 29 degrees. I remember this. The sun was out, but it was a comfortable 29. It wasn't like a cold. Yep. It was really weird. It just felt good to like sit there, you know. Yeah, it was nice. And um so, you know, when when we hung this tree, when we were cutting the lanes, like I was telling you about cutting the lanes and everything. We we're in a cedar that's in a ditch that you know, on each side of the east and west, you can shoot on each side, but on the on the west side, we didn't leave any lanes because all the deer walked on the east side of it, and I was on the east side, Casey was on the west side, so we figured all the deer were going to be walking on the on the east side. And at one o'clock, coming from the north, and like I said, to the north of us, there was two big cedars, and you could not see deer until they were right on top of us, and. On the west side of the tree, Casey's side of the tree, he said, hey, there's deer coming. And I don't know what you were seeing back there. I don't know how you were picking deer off. Casey's got a superhero power of him. <laughs> His spidey and sense. And he can spot deer. <laughs> He's got a spidey sense that I've never seen anybody before. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's deer, moose, elk. does not matter. He can see deer and spot animals better than anybody I know. That's just, that's just way too many days in the field. <laughs> that's all that is. <laughs> that's doing this since I was 15. Uh, that's way too many days in the field. Well, he he goes, I remember him saying, there's deer coming, I don't know what it is. 
and it ended up being a doe. And she, her back was all scuffed up, and oh, yeah. she walked at 14 yards and walked right by us. And she sniffed where we walked in, and she kind of meandered through. And we were like, "Well, our ground sense need <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we need to we need to put our ground set back on high alert." Yeah, our ground scent game was not on point. <laughs> it was it was weak, and um, she kind of kept walking, and it wasn't uh, probably an hour later. Two more does did the same thing, and all on the wrong side. They're all on all my the wrong side, side of the, the tree. tree. Yeah. So after those does did the same thing, I mean these deer at like fifteen yards, walking from the north, can't see them, just showing up and walking to the south. And this is at like two o'clock, two thirty. Yep. And they do that, and after they did that, we had a deep conversation about ourselves, <laughs> about <laughs> should we cut a lane to the back. Now that all these deer are deer doing that, like, should we cut a lane? Well, I hung those cedar boughs back there to yeah. eliminate a skyline. Yep, all the all the all the cedars that we had cut, Casey hung behind us to to break up our outline. And I remember saying, like, I would rather risk you getting busted than have him walk by and not have a shot. Yep, I remember saying that. Like, right. yeah. We got to do something here, so yep. so we did. So we took the took the little nippers out and just cut a hole. And the thing was, is uh, you know, down on the ground back there, there was a hedge apple tree, and there was no leaves on it. It was just looks like a dead tree, but hedge apples. I mean, their branches aren't that big. You know, this one wasn't in particular. And I'm like, I could create shots there. I could I could sneak arrows through there. I knew I could. Um, so we cut a hole there and. We're sitting there, and we're like, okay, the movement, midday movement, three does now, like, things, in my eyes anyway, I'm like, we're going to shape up to have a good evening. Like, that's, but I didn't think the deer movement was going to happen until a little later, but uh, it was like 3.25, and I'm sitting there, and I was actually texting Adam, and Casey goes, well, I, I'll let you take it from here. I don't, really? I don't remember what you said because <laughs> all I heard was there's a deer coming. Yeah, yeah. I was sitting there and and uh, I mean I could just hear them in kind of that tall CRP. There's a they make enough noise coming down through there where you can hear them about eight seconds before you can see them. I mean it's that quick. And that lane behind on the back side of the tree was a short lane. It's a it's a 15 yard as he if they walk through you know further than 15 yards you're toast. And uh, I heard a deer coming, same as those does, and I I just said, I said, A.B., deer coming on the backside back here. I can hear it. I can't see it. And I spun around with the camera, like I spun the camera around, and just as I spun the camera around, I caught a glimpse of him through a hole in the cedar tree, and all I saw was his antlers. And I just remember saying, "Holy shit, it's the big prick." <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even think of the I couldn't even think of the great Hambino at that point in time. Yeah. I said, "Holy shit, it's the big prick." <laughs> yeah, because we had a na- we had him said. named a couple of days before this. Yeah, but the thing is, is I didn't hear him say it's the big prick. So all I heard him say hear him say was it's a deer, and for some reason I had my gloves on. And for some reason, when he said that, I just got up immediately, took my gloves off, and grabbed my bow. Because I knew, you know, the two times before, the the three does, I didn't grab my bow or nothing. I wasn't ready. They were just there. And I'm like, I better be ready. It was quick. It was quick. Yeah. And so we had some practice. So that was good. But he said it was the big prick. I didn't hear that. I kind of looked. I had to look out from Casey's body, and I saw his right side. And I'm like, I still first thing I said to myself was, holy shit, it's the great whoever we named him. Because I couldn't remember the Hambino. <laughs> it's the great Hambino. Yep. And so immediately he's at, I mean, he's at 20 yards already. And he's smelling where we walked in. Oh, yeah. He, he hit our shitty ground scent. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> he smelled our shitty yeah. ground scent. And I'm, like, looking for a hole now without clipping Casey's meniscus. <laughs> and well, he hit our scent, and he actually turned towards us. Yeah, he turned. So and he's, walked, like, four yards closer. Yeah, he's, he's walking south, and we're to the east of him, and he hits our scent and walks to us. And, I, I mean, I already had my bow and pulled back, and he's behind a big tree, and he takes a, a, a turn to the right, and I hit the Garmin, and it said 17 yards, and it gave me a pin, and I panicked. I went complete mush right there. I mean, mush. So with the Garmin, if you double tap it, it gives you your fixed pins. Like it'll give you whatever you sight your fixed pins in at. Okay. Mine's 20 through 60. So I just double tapped, 
and got my 20 yard pin and I'm like, well, I'm just going to let her eat right here and put it on him. And I smacked him. You stopped him. I did stop him. You stopped him. I panicked. You panicked. (laughs) You stopped the deer. The deer was, yeah, he was so close. I was literally like my thought process when I saw the deer was stay wide and see lots of peaking, know you're in focus and leave the camera alone. (laughs) And that's basically what, I mean, it, it, it happened I, we never timed it out, we but should we should time it, time it out. We yeah. should time it out because I guarantee you if you time it out, it's not more than 18, 15 seconds. Yeah. From, from when the, we saw him. To from when him. we saw him to the moment you put an arrow in him. Yep. I mean, it's that quick. Yeah. So. And what Casey was talking about peaking, everybody out there doesn't know, it's when you're filming, you have peaking, which we use red color, but you can use different colors. So, like, you can tell what's in focus. So, whatever's in red for us, that you know that's in focus. So, he's like, I just want it to be all red. And Dude, that screen was red. red. <laughs> <laughs> that screen was red. I couldn't see a damn thing, but red. I'm like, perfect. <laughs> Everything's in focus. Oh, man. <laughs> but, and yeah, then, I and stopped my, him. My next thought was, I got to get way right in the tree here or yeah. else I got an arrow going through my calf muscle. <laughs> yep. He, well, I stopped him, and you can even see on the camera, like, it was an old shit moment. Like, it kind of stopped. He, like, kind of jerks, like, okay, it's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen. Well, I didn't expect it. Yeah. He was like, Mat, and I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. Let go of the camera. <laughs> well, I had to stop because that was literally the only pocket I had right there. If that, if I didn't shoot him right there, it was another 10 yards. He had to go to the south. And it, my hole got smaller, so I was like, it's now or never. He was quartering two slightly, and I put it right behind him and, and smacked him. And, I mean, that arrow hit him hard. He ran oh. straight away from us uphill. Thumped him. <laughs> Thumped him. <laughs> and it was, so if you go uphill, we're in the bottom of the CRP draw, and if he's going uphill, there's two terrace, and... It, you know, there's one terrace, and you go up even farther. There's another terrace, and it goes up to the top of the hill. And he's running. <laughs> and this is where everything becomes real life. And <laughs> before, I mean, before the deer gets 30 yards from us with an arrow in him, Casey turns around and gives me the biggest f bomb, and <laughs> we did it. And he forgets about the camera. Forget about the camera. <laughs> Listen, Jack. He ran out of frame. He went back north around the cedars, <laughs> and when he was out of frame is when I <laughs> shit got real. That's when I turned oh. around. I never thought about him running back into frame <laughs> until a little bit later, and I had to tell you to let go of me so that I could film him. <laughs> so the deer's running up the hill. I'm freaking out. I think I threw my bow out the tree, I think. You were I'm freaking, freaking out. I've never I didn't seen, throw my bow. I've never seen a human shake like that in my life. Oh, freaking out. And he's turning around. We give the biggest handshake, hug, whatever, and all of a sudden I just hold on to Casey's sh- his shirt, and he's turning around trying to get the camera back, and he's well, like, see the let deer. go of me, <laughs> let go of me. You yeah. can hear it on camera. He's like, let go of me. I got to get the camera. And he goes up that one terrace, and then he gets to the next terrace, and he's just, he gets the low ass. You know, it's like the, oh, boy, yeah. not doing good here. Yeah. And Casey actually got back on him right there to see that, and yeah. he went down. And then it was complete Mardi Gras in that tree. Oh, I mean, yeah. it was. I think you actually said, we just set the world on fire. Yeah. <laughs> we just, oh, my yeah. gosh, man. And. Oh, it was unbelievable to see him go down like that, to move the stand, for him to walk under the tree, tiny dancer that morning and just have all wind go out of our sails and then come in here and at 3.30 in the afternoon, I think the first doe that walked by us, I'm almost positive, was his doe yep. probably. Yep. And he had let her go or, she, you know, he was done with her and he was just cruising for another doe. Yep. And he went right by this tree, and we smacked him at 17 yards. I think they went that morning. I think they went 100 yards to the north of us. I think she piled up in that pond dam somewhere in those cedars, and I think he went right in there with her. I don't think they were ever further than 100 yards from us, maybe 150. I don't think I so think either. They, I think they bedded right there in that thick stuff, and he did his thing. We made the right call by going out and around the way that we did mm-hmm. so that they couldn't see us if they were in there. 
Uh, I, I mean, there's just no other explanation. There's no way that he crossed that road. There's no reason for him to cross nope. that road. No reason for her to cross that road when everything that they were looking for was right there. Yep. You know, and uh, yeah, I mean, we gutted it out and and you let the air out of them. Well, I mean, that's just what it is. And two, when we left the stand and got back in that day, we had the mindset also of like we have to like picture that he's there. We got to think that he's yep. there. And we have to do everything right. Yep. We have to do it. You know, even though we're down in the dumps, kind of in a sense, yeah. you know, we have to, you know, stay on the ball and and do things that, how we normally do things, and we got to do it right. So that's why we did the big loop to get out, and why we did the big loop to get back in. So yeah, yeah, and that was, <laughs> I mean, that's what happened, man. That's the Hambino, in a nutshell. That's the great, <laughs> the great Hambino. I mean, there's so many things in the timeline of that deer that, I mean, I'm sure the listeners are probably like, holy hell, what happened? You yeah, know? yeah, I can. I mean, you want to recap it. It was 170-inch double-split G2 buck uh, twice within the first 24 hours, once at, at 10 yards with no shot. Then it was the nine, grunted him in. Three times. <laughs> busted you trying to draw, and then rattled him in and didn't get a shot. Then it was the sneak in the stand and try to get around Ted, the 150-inch eight. And then it was the nine again. You know, I mean, No camera light. Yeah, not enough camera light, the nine in the morning. And then it all culminates with, you know, we we get the Hambino in eyesight. We rattle at him. He comes towards us, but he goes with the doe. We move the stand. He walks under Tiny Dancer. Wind goes out of our sails, 3.30 <laughs> that afternoon, you stick an arrow in him, and he's done. I mean, that's Iowa in a nutshell right there. And that is all across a six-day period, six day span. Yep. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was wild. It was it was, it was. was literally, I mean, Justin, you said it earlier, it's it's the shit dreams are made of right there. Yeah, I mean, to step onto that farm and do what, what was done, I mean, it, it's it's what you dream of. Yeah, that's, those are the stories that make people think that coming to Iowa, you know, gives them – it's going to happen to them. Like everybody thinks those big deer just around every tree in Iowa, just because it's Iowa. But you guys had a really special place there for sure. I mean, it's what, what blows my mind is the the number of quality deer that were there. It, it, it almost seems like they live there. Like there's no reason for them to go anywhere right. else. But on the other hand, why would you have that many mature deer concentrated in one area? Like how, how can they all possibly right. coexist in the middle of November like this. But I mean, the, the answer is probably just the fact that there's a multitude of does there. The competition is probably so yeah. low because of all that CRP, the bedding and the food and just th that those different travel routes through there. I mean, sure. Those bucks come in contact with each other, but I, I just, it, it just seems well, like the competition also... is so low there that they just coexisted. Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, we saw the Hambino for three days until before we killed him. And, you know, I think me personally, I was thinking once we saw him, our our shooter sightings kind of went down. I almost wondered if he kind of came in there and, like, kind of took the place over. Yeah. Well, I personally think he, bu I think he bumped, and, and we left this part out, but I think he bumped a deuce, that big 170 split double split buck i think the hambino bumped him out of there i think that deer was in there kind of running the ship and then the hambino moved in and when he moved in deuce moved out because we did not see him again until oh, we true. actually exited one night and we hadn't seen him in like three or four days that was the night we set the beans yeah we hadn't seen him in three or four days but we okay. left one night and when we left we left to the south and we were parked in in a in a field to the south that was getting cut yeah it was getting cut it was a corn the farmer was cutting it and <laughs> we cut to the truck and we heard a deer run out from in front of the truck and now the tractor and the grain wagon uh the corn wagon are sitting 50, 80 yards in front of the truck yeah sitting right there in front of the truck running running and it's pitch black and aaron goes there's a deer running we could hear the deer running in the cut corn and I'm like, yeah, that's that's wild. You know, you always hear stories about them coming in while they're picking fields. Well, I fire the truck up, and I turn the headlights on, and I swing the truck to the right to turn out, and standing 50 yards in front of us 
in the field is Deuce standing there staring right at us oh yep. as we go to turn around to pull out of the field. The truck. <laughs> I mean, he's literally standing there in the headlights looking right at us. I forgot about that. And and the tractor and the, the wagon are sitting there running, and our truck is running, and he's just standing between us looking at us. So it was like, you know, it was almost like, okay, he got bumped out of there. He moved over because that where he was, that's a totally different section. Different that's farm. a different yep. farm, different yep. section, different – you know, the deer over there move a lot different than the deer that we had. So I think that's his new haunt, and it yep. wouldn't shock me if one of Chad's guys spanks him over there, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. So. Yeah, that's a good point, too. But that that was my initial thought. Like, when, when the Hambino kind of moved in, our, I mean, we did see the nine one other time, but Ted was gone, Deuce was gone. Like, we just didn't see him again. Yeah, you know, yeah. I the Hambino moved in, in and, and moved him out. Yeah, it was a ghost town. But, you know, Justin, to your point, you know, with what they have in there, between the CRP and, and the bean and then the crop and the bedding area and the big cedars, I mean, they have so many pockets and so many places that they can coexist in there. You know, for the majority of the year, they get along, and it's big enough and it's gnarly and woolly enough that come the rut, they can each have their own area, you know. Um, ultimately I think, you know, one of them is gonna, one of them ends up reigning supreme. They always do. And I think the Hambino reigned supreme in there because it got pretty scarce after, after we started seeing him kind of on the regular, it was like, all right, there's a new sheriff in town type deal. It's exactly what do it you, felt like. You could almost feel the shift too. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the Hambino was the oldest buck you saw? I, I don't. I think Ted. I was. think Ted was. I okay. think Ted's the oldest. Yep. Buck. I think I. Th I think the Hambino. I. I. I've got him pegged at six. I think he's six years old for sure. Which I pulled his teeth, and I'm going to send him in, and just just for reference, I want to know what he is. I mean, he he dressed or he was live weight. He was 245 pounds. Yeah. He was a big deer, Jeez. but he was also like when we got him hung up, it was like we think he's pretty old, but I think he was on the downslope. Yeah. Personally. Yeah. Um, and really unique antlered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should probably unique. tell people about his antlers this whole time. You haven't really told anybody what he looks like. Well, the one side no, looks like he's, it's backwards. Everybody's been saying that. Like, his, it's his right side is his beam. He's got a beam and a G2. And off that G2, he's got five. Is it five? I think he's got five non-typical points. His G2, if you were to turn it on its side looks like what his main beam should look like mm -hmm. with tines coming off yeah. of it. Yep. It's wild. And and uh you want to give him the score? Did you tell he's, anybody what he scores? <laughs> no, I haven't said any any scores yet on anything. He's he's got sixteen scoreable and he scored out he grossed at one eighty six and two eights. Damn it. So definitely a deer of a lifetime. And that's at uh fifteen and two eighths inches wide. Yep. So yeah, he, he's only and fifteen two and, and two wide. Wow. Yeah, he's fifteen two. He's fifteen two wide, but man, he's got he's got a ninety nine inch frame, ninety nine and seven eighths or something. Yep. Ninety nine inch frame sitting on eighty seven inches of tine. Yep. He had wow. what? What did he have for mass again? Total mass? Uh, thirty seven and three eighths, I think. Something like that. Yeah, his bases were six and an eighth. Yep. His beams, one was twenty three and an eighth and the other one was like 22 and some change and then his g2 on the left was 13 and an eighth mm -hmm. so he had some he had some good beams had great mass carried his mass and just a all around big heavy massive deer yeah just overall a deer that you look at and you're like dude I don't care what that deer scores like nope. he is. I mean, it helps that he's 186 inches. <laughs> but it, it just I mean, that's that's a deer that you you take all day long. Yeah, yeah you don't let that any time. So you, you guys are Yeah, even if you get him on the ground and he scores, you know, you get him on the ground and he scores in the 150s, who cares? Like right that up. deer is freaking awesome, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, he's just awesome. And the cool thing about it, there's not another deer out there that's like him. So. I've I've been hunting a long time, never seen one like him. No, that's... Ever. It's just an awesome, an awesome hunt for, for you, Aaron, and obviously for you too, Casey. Just to be on the camera, and I mean, it's everybody knows it's a, it's a long wait just to have the chance to hunt Iowa, and you had literally the hunt of a lifetime. Like you, you had the hunt that everybody waits for. You know that you could even if you could ask for it and draw it up. I mean, you you had, you had it all. So it was. Yep. When you it was the best six days of hunting I've ever been a part of. Yeah. And you know, with a bow in my hand for sure, and it'll be hard to top that. I mean, Casey and I over the last seven years have had some really good 
hunts. I mean, Megatron, you know, 183-inch eight-pointer, strong arm, 175-inch, you know, just unique deer also, yeah. you know. Yep. Majestic lion, 208-inch mule deer. Now this one, I mean, it's it, – we've had some unbelievable hunts. This one for me, obviously, because I, I did pull the trigger, it's very special to me. But, uh, I mean – it's pretty cool. It It's something I'll never forget. Even for me, man, I think, you know, to me, when I look back and, and you know, we're only, what, a week removed from it right now, yep. really. But when I look back and think about the hunt, I mean, to Justin's point, like, it was literally what everybody, if you could draw up how a hunt plays out, this would be it. I mean, mm-hmm. to have a crack at 170-some inch deer right out of the gate and then 150-inch mature nine and then the big heavy eight and Ted, and then to see this giant, it's almost like all those, you know, first opportunities that, that just suck the life out of you when they don't happen, they all happen for a reason because look at what you ended up with and look at how the hunt ended up playing yeah. out. And and then the other part of it is like, I'm pretty damn proud that we went into a piece that we have never even stepped foot on before and made happen what mm-hmm. we made happen in yeah. that short amount of time, yep. you know? Yep. I mean, with zero intel whatsoever, just, you know. Didn't use trail cams. Didn't use cameras, just relying on, on you know, techniques and brain power of like, all right, let's look at this place and let's figure this shit out and let's make it happen. And that's what we did, yeah. you know, and, and it worked. And, you know, there's, there's something to be said for that. I mean, I think nowadays, and, and there's an element of that too for me that was really exciting because, Nowadays, I think we get so caught up as as hunters, especially with what we do. I mean, we do do this for a living, so we get so caught up with running trail cameras and stands yep. and knowing yep. what deer is where and how old. I mean, dude, it was so awesome to get in a stand and think, I have absolutely no idea what the hell might step out here tonight. Unbelievable yeah. feeling. I mean, that is a wild and crazy feeling, and I can't help but be jealous of the guys that get to do that a lot because – that's it's totally and you look at you know some of the stuff that that again we just get so caught up with like okay i know this deer i know that deer and there's something to be said for not knowing yep and just like let's do this man let's get our asses in there and do this well and and when we first saw the hambino my first initial thought was all right we got our target let's go get him let's figure him out and let's get him yep and now now it's a one-on-one battle here we Mm -hmm. go Yep. and when i saw that deer i mean it was like he was so unique. We didn't even know we had. No, you know, when we first filmed him, we big. went back to the <laughs> we, we went back to the house and dumped the footage, and we're trying to push in on it. We're like, I think he's got five brow tines. I think he's got <laughs> this. Like we did not know what he had, and we're trying to put a score to him. And I'm I'm like I we're both like at the end of the day, who cares? This deer is a mature deer. We're here for a mature deer. Let's figure this deer out and let's kill him. Yeah, and. I mean, ultimately, that's what happened. No, that's that's incredible, man. I mean, you guys did awesome. It's it's an awesome story, and I can't wait to see, I can't wait to see the cut, the edit when you guys get that out. And, um, you know, Casey, what you were saying about just no intel, going in cold. I mean, that's that's my big attraction to hunting the public land here in Iowa, and that's what I did last year. That's what I did this year. I don't run cameras in there. I, I love that unknown. I just go in there and I, I hunt the land. I read the signs and I just I just do what instinctually I want to do based on what I see in there. And it's I, I I'm not trying to toot my own horn here. I just I, I know what you're saying because that's how I feel when I hunt here. And I, I don't own land. I don't have access to private land anywhere. And I. I I don't know what else to say about it. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more about that that unknown and that feeling of, you know, it's all. Well, I think it's a different sense of satisfaction oh, too, though. Hundred, you know what I mean? Hundred percent. It is. It's so much. It's so rewarding just to to make the right decisions, and I think not knowing that there could be a giant. Like if I had, if I run twenty cameras on three different tracks of public land, and I knew there was a one eighty in there. I'm going to lose sleep over it if, and like, I'm just going to obsess. And if I go in there not knowing anything, I'm going to shoot the first deer that walks by that's in frame and focus and, you know, makes me, you know, gets me excited. And that's, yeah, that, that's all I need out of the hunt. Like I'm not, I'd love to shoot a 180, but 
if I don't know it's there, I'm not going to obsess over it, and I'm just going to hunt the way I hunt, and I'm just going to do what I do. And it's when you kill something like that, it's I mean that that's half the trophy in it, in my opinion. Yep, I couldn't agree more. There, you know, and that's what I look at. Like here in Kansas, I mean, pretty much every stand we go to, we know who we could see, yeah. who we probably won't see. And, you know, there's also something to be said for that because that comes down to, like, you know, the one-on-one game of, okay, I know this deer should be over here based on this wind and this weather pattern and this moon phase and yada, yada, yada. So, I mean, that's a really cool science too. Yeah. But, man, it's been a long time for me since I went in and sat down somewhere having absolutely no clue what's going to walk in. And it was cool. I mean, it was just like – God, I feel like this is I just got started deer hunting again. Like yep. it was it was awesome, man. Yeah. It really was. And you know, I gotta figure out a way to make that happen more <laughs> because <laughs> there's just it's hard to explain. You just don't know. And there's that element of like anything could step out at any moment, mm-hmm. you know. And it helps that it's Iowa. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I mean, it does help that be- it's the Mecca. <laughs> yeah, because because it is Iowa, you you always have hope, right? You're like, man, there could be anything in here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just I But it's all I, relative too. I mean, it could happen in Michigan too. It's like, oh, sure. you never know. I mean, you could be your 180 inch could be 120 inch, you yep. know, and it's just like you just never know. 1000%. Everything's relative to to where you're hunting and what the deer are. So I just, I know one thing, I enjoyed the ever-living hell out of it. It was sweet. It was cool. I didn't double punch. I was in focus. I can't wait to see the cut. I'm sure I'm going to get my ass reamed for the actual kill shot, but we'll uh, we'll let that. We won't bring that up. We'll let that play out. It's on camera. There is impact, but it's in the lower lower right-hand frame. But it's all right, and we're there. Hey, that's, does that still count as in frame? (laughs) It's in frame. It's in frame. You're damn right it's in frame. That's what I did to myself Back him out, panic. I, did you yeah <laughs> self filming man i've been i've been filming all my own hunts by myself uh, hanging bangs every hunt all season long and uh going on almost three straight weeks hunting every day but one which was a travel day and this morning it was like i, I gotta get back to iowa today i gotta i'm flying to new york tomorrow and it's like uh, i should probably go home but i can squeeze in one more hunt and said i'm just gonna go for it and I grabbed two batteries and my GoPro and my XF400 and everything was in the tree from earlier in the week. And eight o'clock, this buck walks up out of a out of a ravine all by himself, just cruising. So I'm following him up through the timber and he just makes a beeline straight for me. And I I pull back, I get a little wide on him, and I'm following up. And I look up and I'm like, oh shit, he's at like 15 yards already. <laughs> I grab my bow and <laughs> I, I come to full draw. I check the camera and. He's walking out of frame, so I'm at full draw, and I, I pull over and I nudge the, I nudge the fluid head with my elbow. I look and he's, he's in frame, and I was like, all right, perfect. And he takes like three more steps, and I shoot and I watch the footage, and he's like, bottom left third, like he he's about to walk out of frame <laughs> again, and I was like, I'll just throw that on a 1080 timeline and scale it up and recenter it. <laughs> Bubbling looks, on it, looks, <laughs> it looks perfect. Center of yep. chip shape. looks perfect. That's why that's you know why that that's why they created 4K footage, right? So yep. for hunters. <laughs> yep. Exactly. <laughs> to make my framing look good. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Right on. But, well, cool, man. I we can wrap this one up. I mean, we're at an hour and a half or so, and all right. But we wanted to get on here. I had a lot of people asking about the story, so I wanted to get this out here and relive the story a little bit with you especially and casey also so we got all three of us on here so it's pretty cool I mean, that's a great story i i can't wait to see the cut i'm excited yeah well everybody gets to see it here in a couple weeks so okay it'll be be fun to see it so the great hambino i think when we open the cut of this uh this new episode that's what we should start it off with like Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the great Hambino, yeah. <laughs> as told by A.B. Casey, Casey actually named him. You know, lastly, before we get off here, Casey actually named him. We were when we first saw him, we both looked at each other, and I think we said it at the same time, like we need to name this deer. Now we're in battle with him, so we knew we wanted to. I don't even know where some of the names we threw out there, like 
big prick was one. Or, <laughs> yeah. I just settled on the great Hambino because you're a baseball guy, right? Yeah. Yep. AB's a baseball guy. And the great Hambino, if you don't know. The Sandlot. Yeah. It's from the movie Sandlot. And if you don't know, you should just end this podcast right now. <laughs> because if you haven't seen the Sandlot, you need to immediately go to Netflix or somewhere and stream it because it's a, it's a classic. So, and I love how. After you shot and we told Chad, the first thing Chad said was, really? <laughs> so get this. Really? <laughs> uh, I got I to gotta say this. Not a lot of people know Chad, and I'm going to send him this link so he can hear this, so he's listening to this right now. But I called Chad. This is right after the deer falls. I grabbed my phone out, and I'm like, I got to call Chad because he knew, I mean, obviously – he knew we were chasing this deer and everything, and I call him and I said, "We we killed the big one and everything, you know." And there was this long pause for like ten seconds, and all of a sudden he just goes, "Really?" <laughs> like it was just so like you did like. I think he was waiting for like the gotcha. <laughs> did, yeah, or like, but I grass bagged him. Yeah, you know what yeah I mean? like, or, or something. We hit him back. Hit yeah, him in the hook. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. Ooh, I clipped a toenail in the back. Like he was waiting for something bad. And <laughs> I'm like, I'm calling you at 3.30 in the afternoon. Like, and I'm talking like, out, I'm loud, out loud. Tree stand. I'm serious right now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He goes, really? Well, then he sent the text he sent afterwards because we're like, oh, we'll call you back. And he's like, okay. And then like 15 minutes goes by and he sends a text and he just says, you're killing me, Smalls. Yeah. And I loved it. I'm like, oh, yeah, somebody's seen the sand lot. Yep. Nice. Well, we, we – we, had, I had to call my wife. Casey was calling his wife. We had to call everybody. Like I said, we set the world on fire. I mean, yeah. it was just that epic, you know, for us. Um, you know, and that was just really cool to do. And and he was getting all fl- flustered because he wanted to see him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah he did. I, I think wow. I would have called him Epstein because, obviously, he's not going to kill himself. You got to go in there and kill him. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. That's right. Oh, man. That's right. Had to throw, had to throw. Oh cool, man! Well, thanks for jumping there. on with this. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm glad we got to catch up finally. We've, we've both been running the gauntlet here between you guys in Kansas and Iowa yeah. and and myself and, uh, I don't know, man. Good, good news is, is my wife still has a tag, and um, we get back from New York, it should still be a little action here. So, gonna try to get her back out on the public land and. I can focus on camera work with her and maybe get one more. There you go. Well, like I said, thanks for jumping on here and, and catching up and you know doing this and yeah. Good luck. Yeah, and I know you got to go to New York tomorrow and get that done and yep. and take care of your business there and get back to Iowa and have her smack one. So I hope so, man. We'll try. Well, cool, man. We'll let you go and thanks for doing this again. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations, guys. Thanks, man. Cross on the